ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Am I talking to you? Am I talking to me? I got ADHD. It's about anything. It's about everything. It's ADHD. Welcome back to ADHD with me. Travis Mills. I'm joined. This is the first time we're meeting, which is really cool. The first time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Harley Sawyer. Thank you so much for coming through, man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, this is going to be interesting because we're just going to become friends in front of everybody. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, for everybody watching, why don't you tell uh, everybody a little bit about yourself? You're on this really cool show on CW. I'm on The Flash. Yeah. Yes. I started on The Flash last, last year, which people love. Great show. Crazy show. Uh, super fun. And I grew up reading comics. So it's like a really fun experience. I was pulling into the parking lot here and there's a Starbucks down the street. And this, I'm not even kidding. There's, there's this guy wearing a flash hoodie. Really? And I was like, that that's a sign. At first I thought it was you walking to the podcast studio. And I was like, he's not going to be wearing That'd his be a own. Little, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, not yeah, going to yeah, wear yeah, his yeah, own, yeah. It's his own show hoodie. Um, but I just thought it was like a cool little, you know, nod from the universe. I'm yeah, like, exactly. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah we're, we're supposed to be doing this. Uh, and you play the elongated man. I do. Yeah. Ralph Dibney, the elongated man. What is that like? Is that a lot of CGI to like, it is, you know, it's a lot of like the visual effects, like the, that stuff is super expensive. So that adds up quickly. So they need me to do a lot of stuff with my body. Good thing you're tall. Like yeah. Me. Well, yeah. you are too. I feel like an get, elongated man just sitting down. Yeah, you know? exactly. Anytime you're on a plane, you're like, <laughs> okay, I'm elongated. Yeah. I need an exit row. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'll see whatever. But uh, it's super fun. And it let me kind of draw on a lot of stuff that I did in college, a little like sketch comedy and stuff like that. Okay. So that was super fun. Like Pratt Falls, like Dick Van Dyke, Jim Carrey type of stuff. Dope. So some of that was super, super cool. Like a lot of physical comedy? Yeah. And like a lot of things with my face. I have like a rubber face. So I can do all sorts of different things with it. What's like, some, like, like, what, like what's like one thing you could do? It just like... Oh, it's just shit, like, okay. Yeah, it just like goes everywhere. Like my skin stretches. It. That's like a natural thing. I'm like, okay, I was born to do this. You're you like know? elastic. Yeah. You have a lot of elasticity. Yeah, I don't know if that's like a condition. I should, I should see <laughs> You should see like, a doctor yeah, for that. Can we get a doctor yeah. in here? <laughs> do you drink a lot of water? I do, yeah. Okay, do. so that probably, that probably helps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you started in college and, and what was, what was like your first, uh, thing that you booked out of college? You know, it's funny. Like I was thinking about this on the way over. I feel like when people, I don't know exactly what your experience has been, but I feel like when people come to Hollywood, mm. they have certain expectations, right? Okay. For themselves, for the business. And for me, the first professional job that I ever did on camera, I came here, I started doing background work. I had you were no, an extra. I had no idea what to do. I was an extra, no idea what to do. I, I ended up doing stand-in work for Kevin Sorbo. Okay. You remember Hercules, yeah. like Legendary Journeys? I did yeah. that. I had long hair at the time. And then the writer's strike happened. This was 08. Wow, yeah, I remember that. And I was like, I'm fucked. Like, I'm fucked. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> Cut to like a year and a half later, I had gotten this, this uh, manager through a series of events, one of which started at, I was working at a cupcake shop on Larchmont. Okay. I used to live over there. We were yeah. talking before the, the so cameras I, cut on. Yeah. I used to work at that Starbucks on Larchmont. Oh, wow. That yeah. I frequented that Starbucks all the time. Yeah. This was, this was 08, 09, somewhere around there. I used before to, my time. Okay. So I used to work there and then I worked at a cupcake shop there and my first agent, he came in and he left and he called the manager and he was like, does that guy want to be an actor? Wow. That was like, and I told my friends that story and they're like, fuck you. That's crazy. Like, yeah. They're like, you fucking asshole. Fuck you. Isn't it? That's like literally how it works out here though. It's like right place, right time. And you just like, just something happens and you either take advantage of the opportunity or you yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's chaos. And I ended up, uh, not with that agent, but I ended up getting another manager and I booked the first pro job on camera I ever did was a pilot that went to series. And that was like the first thing I shot this pilot, got picked up. And then it ran 10 episodes, didn't do great numbers, got canceled. Okay. And I remember when I was shooting that show, me and a couple of the other cast members were on a billboard in Times Square. What was the show called? It was called Glory Days. Glory Days, okay. Yeah, and I met some, I'm still friends with some of those people. I met great people on that show. But my dad called me from Times Square and he was like, I'm walking through Times Square and here's my son, like 65 feet high on this thing. It's a mind fuck. And then you think, okay, the next thing is going to be better. The next thing's going to be bigger. The next thing's going to be this. Cut to me, all the ups and downs then started to happen of like, you work a bit, you don't work. You don't work for eight months, you work, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned that lesson that you just have to go for it. And I know that's a really like Oprah thing to say, but you have to kind of stick it out. You Definitely. Know what I mean? Yeah. Because nobody's going to hand it to you. Nope. And I feel like a lot of people that, that come out here, they... First of all, I feel like a lot of people that come out here in any creative business, 
they kind of lack a work ethic sometimes. Mm. A lot of them do. They just expect shit to happen. Yeah, it's like, I'm here now, you know. What's up? Yeah, exactly. I'm here now, where's my piece of the pie? And like, it doesn't work that way, you know? So that taught me so much in terms of just, you've got to be able to take those those down times, take those, I don't want to say failures, I don't really believe in failure. Okay. But you have to take those times where you're not working and, and kind of look inward and use that as a tool to, to, you know, evaluate yourself and grow as a person. Otherwise, I think you're kind of dead in the water. Yeah, use it as motivation. Exactly, exactly. Like if that doesn't cause somebody to look inward and say, what am I really about and why am I really doing this? I think you kind of fucked, you know? Yeah. Did you have to find like like different odd jobs like in between working? I did everything. Really? What's like the oddest job that, that you held? I used to work... I've done everything. I did Starbucks. I did a cupcake shop. I worked shop. at Starbucks too, by the way. Did you? Yeah. So I, I worked at Starbucks when I was 16, probably 16 to 17 and a half, right before I turned 18. Uh, and I worked at two, to, uh, bro, I was the best barista ever. Okay. Like I was built and bred for Starbucks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mind you, I've, uh, I've had like a latte every single uh, episode of this podcast. Yeah. And it was raining so hard today. I was like, and I was running a little bit late and I was like, fuck, I can't not, you know, continue this tradition. Gotta have it, I gotta yeah. have it. I yeah. gotta have it. Starbucks, if you want to sponsor the pod, call me. Uh, they got so, yeah. you, man. They got you. <laughs> um, my, like this, this, like my, my, 16 year old, you know, when I was like 16, I had a girlfriend and her older sister uh, worked at this one Starbucks by my house and she was like the manager there. Yeah. And so I went in for an interview with her, got the job. I would hope so. Yeah, but yeah that's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, Congratulations. I only worked there. <laughs> thanks. I only worked there for two weeks. Um, yeah. And then I had to transfer because like it was a very small Starbucks and they just didn't have room, you know? Yeah. So I transferred to uh, the Starbucks in Reno Valley and it was the number one Frappuccino Starbucks in Southern California. It was no a drive through No shit. And we sold like the most Frappuccinos in SoCal. So it was, you know, fucking hectic. Yeah. Right? Um, but dude, I loved it, man. And and from there, like, I, I still have friends that I made there, uh, you know, when I was like 16 to this day. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. I feel like Starbucks is a great place to meet people. I ended up going to hair school because some girl came in with like a cosmetology book that, you know, I would like read and stuff while I was behind the counter. And then literally the next day I was like, I'm going to go to hair school, quit Starbucks, went to hair school. So you went to hair school? Yeah. I went to hair school. For how long? What was that like? Oh man, like two and a half years. Really? I'm a licensed cosmetologist. So you were in it. Yeah. I talked about this on the last episode too. Everyone is like so surprised, uh, which I I mean, for good reason, right? Uh, Yeah. So I went to, I went to hair school for like, it took me like two and a half years to finish. Mind you, it should only really take you like a year if you apply yourself. Yeah, I get it. Though. But yeah. you know, I was, I was fucking around. I finished high school when I was 16 and a half. So I was working like, I was working like the graveyard shift uh, at the Starbucks. Yeah. I was working from like 4 a.m. to, you know, noon. Oh man, uh, yeah. And everyone would look like, yo, aren't you supposed to be in like school? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so when I, when I found the cosmetology book, I was like, you yeah, know, fuck this. And so I just started going to hair school, did that. The day that I took my state board test, because you got to go get qualified, you know, yeah. by the state, uh, I passed that. I went on tour and I never did hair, like ever. So you always knew that you were going to be a musician? You always no. wanted that? I always wanted it. I was always in bands uh, in high school. When I was in seven, when I was 17, I was on like local bands, like shitty bands, you know? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, when I was 17, my band broke up and I got a MacBook for my birthday. Nice. And so- it had GarageBand on it. And, yeah. you know, it was my first time like ever learning how to record. I didn't have a microphone. I was like literally singing into my laptop. Yeah. But I started getting instrumentals uh, from YouTube from like other people's songs. Yeah. And just recording like awful, you know, like just freestyles like over these like in i remember one was um was a fergie like was a fergie song was it london bridge like <laughs> lundy 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 dude, what was that dude i don't know i'm trying to think of it but uh oh man it might have been like I, I totally forget i think it was like a black eyed peas song or something like that but yeah it was just like one of these these instrumentals that I could find and I just like wrote and I made a MySpace page. Uh and I was just recording these really shitty songs in in my bedroom. Yeah. Um and then yeah, when I when I took my state board test, I had an opportunity to go and sell merch on a tour. Right. I wasn't even like supposed to play. But my friend was like, yo, I'm an official sponsor of this tour. I have a clothing company. Uh, and I have, uh, it was the Vans tour. Yeah. And he's like, I have this, I have this tent, you know, at the Vans tour every day. If you set up the tent and you break it down and you sell all my shirts, I'll give you a spot on the bus. Like you can sleep on the bus. Nice. And I'll let you play like a 10 minute set every single day. 
So I was like, oh shit. Okay. He's like, I'm not going to pay you. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Yeah. But that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So literally, uh, I brought, I brought my laptop. I like left the state board test. Uh, cause you take it at like 6am. So by 8am i had found out I passed, drove to the first date of the tour. I had my MacBook and like a tower of blank CDs. And I was like burning these CDs. Like every morning I'd wake up, I'd burn like a hundred to like 200 CDs. I'd write like my URL on, on the CDs. Yeah. I'd write my little name. Uh, and I'd go in the lines after I'd set up the merch booth and I would just literally like, I'd have uh, like an iPod with headphones and I'd just show kids, you know, my music and try to get them to buy these CDs yeah. for like five bucks. Yeah. And that's how I literally survived. And then once I got enough money, I, you know, called my friend and he printed me some t-shirts and then I'd go in the line and I'd try to sell t-shirts. Uh, and the, I mean, kind of the rest is history. You know, I made a lot of connections on that tour that when I got home, you know, just kind of took forever to like keep doing shit. Yeah. But that one thing kind of, you know, that shitty opportunity that I said yes to. Well, yeah. Led I mean, to everything else. That's what I think is really interesting about people that get any success in, in the creative, in any creative business is like, you know, I went back to, I went to a college, Emerson College in Boston. Okay. And I go back here and there. And What'd I you talk, go to college for? Uh, I went there for theater and philosophy. Wow. So like bullshit and bullshit. Basically, <laughs> right? It was like, I it was like a private college. I left, I was like, I got to pay all the student loan debt. And I was like, what do I have to show for it? You know, but the experience was great because I met people there that, mm. that are still dear, dear friends of, for, uh, of mine to this day. And I'll go back and I'll talk to the students that are in their senior year and like, I love this question. I've gotten this question a couple of times. It's like the business of acting class taught by a professor named Brad Lamack, who I'm still friends with, great guy. And they'll be like, so yeah, um, how do I get an agent at ICM or an agent at CAA? And I'm like, all right, yeah, you know, here's the deal. Get a job that you don't fucking hate where you can pay the rent and maybe save a little bit and then worry about everything else. Mm. Because I don't think people realize how challenging it is when you get out here, you yeah. know what I mean? And that people that have success, there's stories like that where it's like, for me, I always think of, I, I keep thinking of chaos lately in my life. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but like serendipity, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. It's like you find yourself in a situation where, fuck, how did I get here? This is great but I, I, I wouldn't know the roadmap. Like I could, I could trace it back. I've stumbled into every exactly. piece of success I've, I've had. That's exactly right. I've yeah. stumbled into all the success that I've had. People say right place, right time, whatever, right role, right, right anything. But it just feels like a bit of a mystery to me in that sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm yeah. still paying off uh, my student loans me from hair school. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, I'm paying them off from college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, because I didn't pay them for so long. Yeah. I, you know, and so, like, the interest kept going and going and going. Oh, yeah, and then, speaking my language, yeah. Whoo, finally, I'm like, you know, 11 years later. Oh, I'm, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think I'm almost done. You know? I'm close. I'm close to being done. It's going to yeah. feel really good. That was my graduation present was like looking at the amount <laughs> and being like, oh, I could have bought a fucking house <laughs> and now I got to pay this and Definitely. I don't have a job. Yeah. I'm doing background work. <laughs> like, great. Cool. Yeah. Like 18, I was just like, nah, I don't, you know, it's not like they're going to like throw me in jail. I'll see how long I can go well, without and, paying it. You know, and I love that. Like when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, and I moved out here when I was 22 or 23 and I had this thing in me that was like, fuck it. You know, and I mean that in a good way. That was like, fuck it. I'm going to go for it. I have no plan B. I'm going to see what happens. And I think there's a lot of power in that and being like, let's just go out there and I'm going to put myself out there. And What's I'm the worst that could it. happen? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess a lot of bad things could happen, but- 100%. Yeah. But in that process, I've done every job. I mean, you can, with the exception of whoring myself out, <laughs> which hasn't happened yet- <laughs> Yet. Thank you, CW. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe tonight, who knows? Uh, but that hasn't happened yet, but I've done it all, man. And I mean, before I even got this job, nobody knows this, I've never told anybody this publicly. Before I got this job, I had worked over the years, but it was so up and down. Before I got this job, I was working four jobs. Wow. Six or seven days a week. And went in on this audition, I thought it was the worst audition I'd ever given in my life. And then got the call, went in, recurred last year. They're like, yeah, we're going to bring back next year as a series regular. And it's great. But I had no idea. Yeah. You know, I was just like, I was in those four jobs, six, seven days a week. And I, I remember this feeling of like, eventually the tracks are going to run out. Like I'm on the train and eventually the tracks are going to run You're out. You're like holding on for dear life. Right, right, right. And it was like this real survival, almost feral thing where I was like, I'm just going to have to figure this out. And I had no plan. 
And I wouldn't wish that upon anybody, but it teaches you so much about yourself, I think. You know what I mean? 100%. Yeah. Isn't it funny that I, I, I like every, uh, every like guest star thing I've booked uh, has been the worst audition ever. Like yeah. I walk out of there feeling awful, yeah. you know, about yeah. myself. And I'm just like, oh, th this shit sucked. And I remember uh, I called my girlfriend. I just did, I did the show alone together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I think it's on like Hulu. It's on free, free form. Uh, and I remember I called Madeline when I left and I was like, I fucking, I just bombed that. Like, I fucking suck. Oh, yeah. She's like, I'm sure it's not that bad. Literally, they called me back that day. I got it. Yeah. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah. what yeah. is this? I called my agent after I left the one for Flash, and, and I was like, I'm ruined. It was like Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. I was like, I'm ruined. Like, I'm done. I'm fucking done. <laughs> he was like, it wasn't that bad. I was like, no, everything went wrong that could have gone wrong. I was, I was late because they didn't have me on the list when I arrived at the gate to get in with security. All that shit. I mean, I went upstairs to go read for these executive producers and everybody and walked in, had to piss like a steer. And the casting assistant comes out and she's like, uh, you ready? Oh and I was like, God. oh, I need to. She's like, you're the last one. They're waiting. I'm like, great. This okay. is really, yeah, of course I'm so ready. You're like yeah. dancing. Yeah, I'm like doing, like doing the audition like this. So like, Why is he crossing his legs so much? I love it. Book him, you know? Um, and it worked out. And that's always been a mystery to me because I think when you're right for things, you're right for things, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've ever felt right for something. Yeah. I feel like I'll get a little bit of success and that's almost like the motivation and fuel to, you know, keep going. Right. You know? Um, yeah, because, I mean, look, even once I struck success with music, like, you know, that was really good. And then something bad would happen and, you know, I'd have a dry spell and I'd have to yeah. like figure some shit out. But I think it's just like the putting one foot in front of the other. And, you know, if you believe in something, if you, if you have fun and enjoy doing something and that's all you can really see yourself doing, you're going to find, you know, you're going to find a way. Yeah. I think you, I, th I think that's true, but I don't think that necessarily everybody looks at it that way. No, know? but I think it's a thing. I think it's a matter of, of work ethic, like you said, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who have good intentions or who are like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, but they don't do X, Y, and Z to get there. Right. Yeah. They think it's like wishful thinking. They think it's being optimistic. Yeah. They think it's like asking, you know, a couple times, like you have to be literally fucking relentless, you know, like, I mean, working four jobs and going to auditions, like a lot of people would just say, fuck it. I have another shift tonight. I can't go to an audition and learn these lines. Yeah. And you know, there were, there were times that I wanted to do that, that I was like, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this. But I remember when I turned 30, Throughout my 20s, I had this idea of like how my life, and I'm 33 now, but like I had this idea of how my life was going to be and how my career was going to be. And it was very myopic. It was like it had to be that way. And I didn't really realize this at the time. I wasn't conscious. But when I turned 30, I, whatever, something shifted to me, that kind of thing, where I realized, and this was extremely liberating, I realized that my life could go like, I was like, oh, it could go this way or this way or this way. Four or five different ways. And like when I die... I'm going to be happy. Like, I'm going to be cool with it all because it, it brought into perspective all the things that really mean more to me than any of this stuff that I can't control. Yeah. I love what I do, but I can't control which job I get, don't get all that stuff. And it made me realize that like when I'm on my, it's a, it's a macabre thought, but I was like, when I'm dying, what am I going to care about? I'm going to care about like my wife, my kids, uh, my brothers, if they're still alive, the dogs, the home we have. If I win a fucking Oscar, I'm not going to care about be holding that. your Oscar. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> any day now, good. Lord, any day now. You know, like I, if, if I'm worth a hundred million dollars, I'm not going to give a shit. What I'm going to care about is that stuff that I can have in any different avenue. And it liberated me to kind of pursue what I wanted to pursue more than I'd ever experienced before. What was turning 30 like? It was a mind fuck. Okay. I'm about to turn 30 in, in like three months. How do you feel about it? Uh, excited, scared. Uh, I feel like, I don't know. What's weird is that I'm more self-aware now. I mean, more now than ever, right? I sure. think that just comes with age. Um, I'm more confident in myself now. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm having more fun, not only in life, but like with my career now. Right. And I'm, I'm like, I'm down. I'm almost like down to take more risks now than when I was 20. Yeah. You know, back then it was like. I don't know. Everything was so, pre I didn't even get to enjoy like my come up, yeah. you know, because I was so stressed out. 
I know what you mean. Like, I didn't even get to, like, there's moments that I look back on, you know, where it's like me and my friends in this tour bus, you know, on this tour. And like, I was the most miserable that I've ever been. Yeah. Because you're just thinking about all of these possibilities and yo, what if this goes away tomorrow? Or like, you know, what if, I don't know, I can't buy a house, you know, and like just we, the weirdest things are like, yeah. I want, you know, my music video to look like this, 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 this. And like in the long run, like it doesn't really fucking matter all that much. No, it, it like, it doesn't. I mean, it does in the moment, but I think like turning 30 for me brought me to, I mean, you can say the present moment or whatever, but it was like one of the things I really learned around the time of turning 30, which was so powerful for me was what I don't want mm. and what I don't give a shit about. And that helped me shift my identity where I was like, okay, I love my job and I love my work. And this is a huge passion of mine. I'm not going to die without it. You know, yep. I'll find a way to do it no matter what. It doesn't have to be on the CW or on an ABC or in a fucking movie or anything like that. I'll find a way to fulfill this regardless. Because if you're really somebody who has any of that in you, that impulse to be an artist in you, you will always find a way. Yeah. And that empowered me to embrace that and realize that I will always find a way and I'm not going to die without it, you know? Yeah, I feel like when I was younger, I was just so stubborn and like one track minded. Me right? too. Like it has to be this right. or nothing. That's what I mean. When I got that first job, it was like, okay, now it's going to be this. And then you're going to be in movies. And then you're going to do this. And then you're going to do that. I'm not God, you know, or whatever. I'm not that powerful. Neither are you, you know? It's like we have to take what we get when we get it, but we also have to put in that effort and put in that work. But I think that, that single focus on things teaches people so much about themselves if they allow it to. And if they don't, then I think they're going to burn out, you know? Yeah. Another thing that uh, I really respect about you, man, is you, uh, you volunteer at the South LA animal shelter. I do. Yeah. And you know, what's crazy is I adopted my dog Fig Newton from that same shelter. When did you adopt this dog? Five years ago. Five years. So I didn't like know that. Five, dog. Yeah. Uh, five and a half, maybe six, he might be six now. Okay. okay. Um, He's That's like great. a min pin terrier. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to, I definitely wanted to adopt. Um, and you know, I grew up with animals my whole life. Uh, but when I, when I walked in there, he was just like, he was the only dog that didn't bark. Yeah. And you know, like I'm just so affectionate with, with like, you know, with him. So like going into the adoption process, I was like, all right, I, I got to be able to like pick this, you know, pick this dude up yeah. and like make sure like he can hang with me. And literally I picked him up. He put his head on my little shoulder and like, and like set it down. And I have a picture uh, from that day, like way back on my Instagram. Um, and like fans have drawn pictures of it. And he literally just like fell asleep, like outside, you know, like outside in that waiting, there's yeah, like dude, a, a yeah, little receiving. outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he just like fell asleep, like it, on my shoulder. I was like, this is it, done. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And got the little red leash that they put around his neck yeah. and uh, drove him home. And when I was driving home, I, I was so happy, but I like looked at him and for a moment I was, I was so scared. I was like, what the fuck did I just, like, I'm responsible for you. Like, yeah, you had the right reaction. Yeah. Like I am responsible, like whether you live or die, it is up to me now. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's, it's been the best decision I've ever made in my whole life. He is, I got so lucky. Like I adopted the perfect dog. You know, it's funny. It's like, that was something that for me, I volunteered there now for a few years and I go there as often as I can when I'm in LA and I'm not working. And I've done the thing where I've flown in and been here for like 36 hours and I still go in on a Saturday and I spend my day there and do as much as I can. But I want to, I want to be clear. There's people out there who do 50 times the stuff that I do. Like, I don't want to sound like I'm a cool guy. Like I'm the guy doing so much. There's people out there who do so much more work than I do. But when I was working those four jobs, Saturday was sometimes my day off, usually my half day off. And I would go there on my day off or my half day off. That probably did wonders for your self-esteem though, right? It did. Yeah. Because it felt like everything was out of control and it gave me a sense of like, no matter what, you have some ability to give back, to, you know, have some kind of control in this crazy world that we're living in. And I think that's the thing that's super important to me is when anybody gets any kind of success on any level, how are you paying it forward? How are you giving back? How does that manifest for you? Because if you're not, that's, I think, extremely problematic. Mm. Because you and I sitting right here, we're super fucking lucky. Like we're yeah. really, really lucky people. And I believe in proceeding from gratitude. And to, to find a way to give back, I think that's so empowering to me. Like, be, like I say to people, like be of service, it will save you. And I actually believe that. I really do believe that. Because it did save me being there. And then I adopted my dog Maggie in 2011. I fostered her. What kind of dog? Uh, she's a pit mix. I have all, I have all pit mixes. 
dumb. And I love pit bulls. I love them. They're so misunderstood. People think they're like horrible, horrible dogs. No, my next dog is either going to be a pit or a German Shepherd. Oh, they're so, like pit bulls are so loving. People misunderstand them greatly. And I've worked with hundreds of them there and they're all amazing. And, you know, I adopted Maggie in 2011 because I fostered her through an organization called Angel City Pit Bulls, great, great organization. And I fostered her for a couple months and then I ended up doing what they call a foster failure where they called me and they were like, hey, somebody wants to meet her. And I was like, nah. <laughs> I was like, no way. I was like, I can't. You can't picture. give her up. Yeah, I was like, I can't picture coming home to my apartment and not having her there. And she kind of cracked the whole thing open for me because that was the first time in my life where I really got a sense of what it was like to care so much about another living being, you know? And the fact that I was like, look at this dog. I'm like, I fucking do anything for this dog. I do anything for this dog. Nothing will stop me from giving this dog everything that she needs, everything she deserves. And then cut to like a year and a half later, I went to the Baldwin Park shelter, which is a county shelter on uh, Christmas Eve, actually. They were doing a drive there to like drop off supplies. I saw this dog. She was another pit mix. And her name's BG now, which stands for baby girl. And she's called baby girl because she was just in the corner, not making eye contact, just doing this. And for 25 minutes, I couldn't get her to even look at me. She was totally shut down. And I made her a promise, which like, I don't make this promise to any dog anymore. I, I did once, and that was a dog named Nino that I brought home last year that I had for five, six months, and he passed away, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. He was ter he's terminally ill. He had okay. kidney failure. And did you know that before adopting him? I, I didn't know that when we got him out of the shelter, and he was with a rescue, and they said, you know, he's really, really sick. And I said, I'm going to bring him home, and I'm going to give him what he deserves. The best life, yeah. Yeah, before he goes. Um, but I made Nino a promise, but before that I made BG a promise where I said, I will get you out of here. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Cut to me bringing BG home. And she's named baby girl because I just said, I'm going to get you out of here, baby girl. I'm going to get you out of here, baby girl. I'm going to get you out of here, baby girl. And I would go back and forth to Baldwin Park, which is like a 45 minute drive. I did that for weeks. I would call every morning, every time before they closed, make sure she was still alive because she was red listed at one point. She was going to be euthanized. And then I finally just like, fuck it. And I brought her home. Damn. And now she's part of the family, you know? Yeah, 100%. It's I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine my life without Fig. Me neither. Well, today's podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Um, from websites and online stores to marketing tools and ad analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Squarespace empowers millions of dreamers, makers, and doers by providing them with the tools they need to bring their creative ideas to life. On Squarespace's dynamic all-in-one platforms, customers can claim a domain, build a website, sell online, and market a brand. Uh, their suite of products combines cutting-edge design and world-class engineering, making it easier than ever to establish and own your online presence. Uh, you guys can go check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch... You can go to squarespace.com slash ADHD to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, go to squarespace.com slash ADHD. I'm going to give you 10% off of your purchase of a website or domain. If you want to make a fan site, if you want to make a rescue dog site, uh, if you want to make a yeah. site of just my face on it, go to yeah. squarespace.com slash ADHD. 10% off. I mean, You're going to get 10% yeah. off. off. Uh, yeah, ready to start your new business ready to start a clothing line make it with squarespace damn i should make fig newton his own website with you squarespace should. yeah, yeah fignewton.com i love that he came from south right well when i was reading uh you know cuz obviously you know your team and stuff sent over a bunch sure. of stuff yeah, and yeah. they said that you're super passionate about rescuing animals and that you volunteer there it was just like one thing after another i was like dude that's where i got my dog and so it was it was really dope uh just you know to learn that about you man cool. and during the fires and everything uh, a cool thing, you know, the fire obviously was an awful, awful yeah, experience awful. and especially for all the animals. Um, but we spent like two weekends going around to all of the different animal shelters trying to volunteer. And to our surprise, we would go in there uh, and, you know, with supplies and stuff and they'd be like, yo, like, honestly, we're we're full like we're yeah. stocked like like yeah. we have we have an influx of of support we have like all of this food we have all these blankets yeah. and it was frustrating because we couldn't like as hard as we tried yeah. we couldn't help you know that's the thing that i love though is like you know i sometimes i get caught up i'll be honest with you sometimes i get caught up in cynicism because it's like it's a tough world it's a brutal world and you often see the worst in people particularly when you work 
at a shelter and volunteer at a shelter, you see like, you know, I've seen- Because you're getting animals that are coming in, you know, abused and, and beaten. I've seen acid the, burns down the back. I've all, seen yeah. like half a foot missing because the guy took a hammer claw and did that. You know, you see it all. And so it burns you out. It's like compassion fatigue, you yeah. know, it starts to burn you out. But then every time that happens, something great happens like that, where you see people really come together over an event like that. And I hope that kind of thing sustains because the only, you know, whether it's animals or whether it's Black Lives Matter or anything that's worth changing and needs to be changed, it's only if people keep showing up, yeah. right? You know, and that's the tricky thing is to get people to keep showing up, keep showing up, motivated to do that, you know? Yeah, we went to, uh, I mean, and dude, like for two weekends, we were driving like an, you know, an hour and a half, like outside yeah. of here. Um, and we we went to this, they had set up this, um, this kind of like base camp at this college. Uh, and we showed up and there was horses like on the football field. Yeah. You know, there was like big like tortoises and like yeah. turtles like that were being walked. And like, it, it was just, it, and so, we, you know, we brought this stuff and they were like, yo, like we're honestly like, we're okay. You know, thank you guys so much. Um, and so we just kind of hung out for like, you know, 30, 40 minutes yeah. and just watched like these people just like with their animals. And, and, you know, there was a woman who slept in her truck um, at that college because she wanted to just watch her horses yeah. like, in the field. Yeah. Which was, um, I don't know. I walked away from there being like, wow, like, I guess, you know, people aren't that bad. There's people out there that are just incredible people and, and shows, I think the, the potential that like we all have to do that kind of stuff. And that's what I meant when I said that like people hear what I do at the shelter and in the rescue community, they're like, oh, that's great. And they love to say this because I'm on a superhero show. They're like, he's a superhero in real life. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's great. And like, that's, I know that's a pitch and everything. And that's lovely to hear. But there are people out there like that, that are doing this stuff, that live and breathe this stuff all the time and sacrifice so much to do it. Mm -hmm. And I marvel at that. I absolutely marvel at that. It's an incredible thing. For everyone listening, for everyone watching, uh, if you had to give them like one piece of advice for anything that they could do to help, you know, those shelters, help those animals in there, what would you say? I think that I would tell them to show up and, and get a sense of it and go to certainly any shelter that's near you and see what it's like and see what it's like to be there and see what the dogs are doing and, and how they're living. But in particular, I have to plug the South LA shelter because we're lacking in volunteers. Like people, mm. people don't go there, I think, because of the part of town we're in, honestly. And that's something that I struggle with because some of the volunteers that I have that work with me, we do a large dog walking class there every Saturday morning to get the dogs out, get them used to, to leashes, get them used to other dogs, get them used to being with people that will help them get adopted. And also to get them out of their kennels too, because one of the most common things I see there is we take a dog out that we don't know. And it's the first time the dog's been out in four months. Damn. It's been in the kennel for three, four, five months. I've seen dogs that have been there eight months and it's like, has this dog ever been out? Nobody knows. And that's, that's terrifying. Yeah. Me because they're sitting there and I've seen dogs go, you know, kind of kennel crazy after a while because they're just sitting in this small run and they just never get out, never get socialized. Oh, he's a bad dog. No, he wasn't a bad dog. He just wasn't, he wasn't fostered in any way. He wasn't, you know, encouraged in any way. But um, in the South LA area, a lot of people don't, go there for whatever reason. And I work with some young volunteers that are from that area. And it's, it's really tricky for me because I think people associate that area with negative things, which is a really unfortunate thing. And people, I think people think it's an unconscious thing. They think, oh, that's where the riot started. Oh, that's where this is. That's where, oh, dogs that come from those areas are bad dogs. It's not true. It's not true. A lot of our dogs go to other shelters in the city and they get adopted like immediately. I've seen yeah. that happen too. It's a crazy thing, but we all have to kind of reprogram ourselves and we need the help there. People don't come and show up there. Definitely. I mean, I feel like like when I got Fig and I brought him home, he, I could tell he was from like, one, he's scared, he's scared of kids still. Yeah. So I feel like he was you know, I tried, I tried to like piece his, like his backstory together, yeah. you know, as good as I could. But yeah, the first night I, I took him home, uh, you know, I, I was walking him around the block and any kind of like apartment building or anything with stairs, he was just kind of like trained to like go up to yeah. like the very top floor. Um, and he's very scared of like small children. He yeah. gets like really frightened. So what I think is I think that, uh, I feel like he, he, you know, was like in a house with yeah. a bunch of kids and for whatever reason, I don't know, like he just, he didn't like it and the door opened and he bolted 
That's yeah. that's what I think. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah. put that together where like yeah. he just got the fuck out, and he was on a second floor <laughs> like, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. he knows, Yeah, he gets because like literally for for about three or four weeks, anytime we'd walk past stairs, he would just go up. Yeah, and he's I, like, go know, home now. <laughs> yeah, let's go home now. <laughs> like, nah, dude. No, come no, on. no, we don't live there. We don't, yeah. <laughs> um, but he's been a huge blessing in my life, and I mean, you know, he's when Madeline's gone, like he you know sleeps like on her pillow, like he'll literally put his head on her pillow, yeah. and like face me. He's he's the best. Yeah, I mean that's something that I found with with my dogs uh before i even started volunteering at the shelter was i'm somebody who you know i've struggled with depression in my life pretty severe depression at times and anxiety and i haven't talked about that a lot either I've had but horrible anxiety yeah I, I anxiety my whole life and i've been in some some you know severely deep depressions and you know honestly the thing that got me through were my dogs it really was. And like people have emotional service animals all the time now. And a lot of them have them for bullshit reasons, which is problematic for people that really need them. But the power of, of an animal being next to you and having that, you know, just that quiet love and that quiet strength next to you. They're my little like batteries. Like I work in Vancouver a lot and that can wear me down because the only place that I really recharge is like, on the couch in front of the TV with the two of them. They're like my little batteries that just like build me back up. Girlfriend can't do it. You know, mom can't do it, but the dogs do it better than anybody. Do you ever bring them up with you? I haven't yet. Like we're talking about relocating up there. We might do that. We're not sure yet, but I haven't brought them up yet because uh, my Maggie, the older one, she's almost 13. I don't want to like fly her up, fly her back, be yeah. too much for her. I mean, she hates elevators. How's she going to feel about planes? I've never brought Fig on. I don't, dude, I have a hard time just bringing him out to restaurants. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I don't ever want, like, I, I want it to always be a good experience for them and not make it about me and, and you know, always have their best interest in mind. But we might do that move and go up there and, like, they'll live in Vancouver amongst, you know, rain all the time up there. It's snow and, and just yeah, the cold. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is beautiful up there, all my Vancouverites. It is beautiful up there. Yeah. yeah. It's totally different from here, except tonight. Tonight, it's like we're in Vancouver. You, yeah, you just, it, it's it's awful. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys can see it outside, but it's it's literally- It's pissing. Dumping. Yeah. Um, how many tattoos do you have? I noticed you have a tattoo right there. I only have one. I have this one, which is not finished, and I'd like to get more. The story I, of my life. Yeah, I've never pulled the trigger on anymore. Um. I'd like to get more, but I think being on camera so much, I always have that thought where I'm like, well, they got to cover it up. They got to cover it up. But then you look at a guy like Tom Hardy and you're like, well, if he can do it, <laughs> but then I'm like, he's Tom fucking, Hardy gives me hope, dude. He's fucking Tom I'm like, Hardy. I, I could have a film career, uh, you, you know, or it could. Could, could be on a Breaking Bad or on a, on Pe a like Peaky a Blinders. Sons of Anarchy or something like that. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, I'm, I've had my chest unfinished for probably almost eight years. You got to fill it in, right? It's just all outlines. Yeah. I like yeah. colored in the bottom and I just haven't, <laughs> I haven't finished it. My whole thing was my brother. This is like the Sawyer family crest. It's your family crest. Yeah. Yeah. And my brothers and I all got it done at the same time. The youngest of three boys. And the thought was, this was in, I think 2012. And it was like, okay, well, we'll all get it finished together. They're in New York. I'm out here. Here we are six years later, seven years later. I'm like, when is this fucking going to get done? So there, you guys are all at the same spot. We're all at the outline <laughs> stage where it's like, when are we going to fill it in? I guess like when we're corpses, we'll get it filled <laughs> in, right? You know? So That's I kind of want to get it done, but I, I think I just need to lead the charge on that and maybe they'll follow. I've, I've had some of my tattoos covered up. Uh, like while shooting shows, I have an Apple logo tattooed on my, on my palm. So like sometimes when they get all weird about, they can't uh, do that. Copyright, yeah. yeah. So, so that's a weird one to cover up though, because you know, you use your hand to grab everything. Do you have so any like, that you regret? Uh, no, I don't, I don't really, no, I don't regret any of my tattoos. I have like a really shitty, um, like kind of day of the dead skull on yeah. my, like a gypsy skull on my foot, um, that I'll probably cover up yeah. one day. Um, I'm covering up my entire right leg right now. I had an owl that was sitting on two joints. Yeah, uh, that's cool. It said life's a hoot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I had weed leaves just like, literally my whole right leg is purple weed leaves. How old were you when you got that done? Oh shit, like 20, 21. Okay, so you're pretty young. Yeah. I, was, I was young. I started getting tattooed at 15. Really? Yeah, I got my first tattoo at 15. It's right here. It's, it's on my thighs and I got it so, you know, when I was at home, like even if my parents like walked in, you know, and I was in my boxers or something, they couldn't see it. Yeah. You know, cause I mean, yeah, you, you know, and then from there I got, I think my second tattoo was diamonds outside, like literally like same, same spot, just like on the outside of my thighs. It's like all covered in here. <laughs> yeah. Literally I have like a bunch of tattoos right here. Um, and then my third tattoo was my foot. And I got it in some dude's garage. Yeah. Uh, and listen, like a little word of advice 
for everyone watching or listening is uh, if your tattoo artist, one, like doesn't work in a shop, you know, <laughs> and like you're in a garage and if he takes a, a big pipe and just like lights it up and takes a huge hit uh, right before he starts tattooing you. You're in a great place. It's it a might great- not. Yeah, it might not. And you're and you're like 16 years old, yeah. you know, and you're paying like 80 bucks. Uh, it might not be a good idea to yeah, go yeah, through yeah. with it. Um but, you know, you live and you learn. Uh, and then my mom, that was the first tattoo my mom found. Okay. Uh, because, what was I doing? I was like laying on the couch or something and I, I took like my shoes off and I took, I just forgot, dude. And I yeah. took my, like my, I was like taking my sock off and she saw it and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and I was like, well, to make Matt, you know, now that the cat's out of the bag, I showed her my leg tattoos. Um, but nothing, will, I have my forehead tattooed. Yeah like in the corner of my head and I got it in red. And this was after I had like my sleeve and you know, I one, I never asked my parents uh, if I could get tattooed. Sure. I just, I just did it. Like when I was 18, uh, I remember we, we were going to like uh, some, some place with, uh, with, with my dad and my mom and we were going to play like blackjack and, you know, we went to like some like uh, Indian, an Indian reservation to like a casino. And um, I was getting tattooed that day and that was the day I was getting my knuckles tattooed. Didn't tell my dad. You can't hide that. Can't hide that. And so literally I show up and I sit next to my dad to play blackjack. Knuckle, just knuckles tattooed. And just, he's like, what? When I got my hand tattooed, my parents went on vacation. Yeah. My tattoo artist came over to my house, tattooed my whole hand. It swelled up like a boxing glove, right? Yeah. Just yeah. It's so puffy. They come home from vacation. I have my fucking hand tattooed. <laughs> I get my neck tattooed. This is the worst one, dude. I the day I got my neck tattooed, I was 19. And um, I come home from getting my neck tattooed, and my dad got bit by a snake. Okay. No I shit. I grew up in Riverside, so it's like, you know, hella orange trees. It's like, like yeah. desert and shit. So there was a snake in my house, and it was like behind like like the TV. And my dad was trying to like get it out of the house, and it fucking bit him, right? Fuck. And I walk in the door after my dad gets bit by a snake. And I have my fucking neck, <laughs> I have my neck tattooed. And ironically enough, it's Medusa. So like, I have, that's fucking weird, man. <laughs> that's so fucking weird. I have, I have fucking snakes tattooed on my neck. I'll never forget. My dad looked at me and you know, he's like, he has like ice and like fucking like this thing wrapped over his hand and he just shakes his head and he goes, you look like you just got out of jail. Oh and uh, yeah, God. he didn't talk to me for like a week. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, you know, I love my parents. We're we're on amazing terms. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Did uh, I read you did one yourself? Is that like a thing? Oh yeah, I've tattooed myself a couple times. I've tattooed this like shitty skeleton holding a holding like a beer bottle there. I have the word gnarly tattooed on me twice. Nice. I have it on my stomach in like really crazy like old English font, but then I also tattooed it above my my knee. And you said fuck it and like went for that one night? Yeah, well, it, the the guy that tattooed my hand, I used to like literally when I was 18 like sleep at at this tattoo shop. Like yeah. I like lived there, right? Yeah, like yeah. uh and and so one night we got all fucked up and uh I was like, I want to tattoo myself. And he's like, okay, cool. He's like, what do you want to tattoo? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Like I picked this off of like a flash art wall, yeah. you know? And then I was like, uh, and I want to tattoo gnarly on my leg. So he drew it out in like this really cool cursive. Sure. Put the stencil on me. And like tattooing yourself is so hard because you got to use a pedal, you know? So you have to use like your foot to yeah. like, to do it. But then like when you're pressing in your fucking skin, it fucking hurts. Yeah. It's so like your leg has this like weird reaction. Um, just awful. I've I've like when I was like 16, I built a tattoo machine out of like a uh, guitar string and uh like I forget what I use, but like like essentially a fucking uh, like a walkman like walkman batteries and like just yeah. weird, just weird, you know, and like a ballpoint pen like casing. I I, I like it's like prison style. Almost. Literally yeah. I built like a prison tattoo yeah. machine and I would tattoo like my friends, like just like horrible things. I saw I tattooed like a heart in inside like my my hand right here, it fell out. Um but yeah, I've just been making bad decisions. What drew you to that culture, to the whole tattoo thing, or the whole like? When I, dude, I'll remember. I was like, I was like ten years old, and I looked up at my mom and my great grandma, and I was like, uh, well, the first thing was I always wanted stretched ears. Yeah, uh, we'd be in the mall, like growing up, like you know, little kids. I'd see kids with Capri Sun straws yeah. in their ears, yeah. like as jewelry, and I just thought that was so cool. Yeah. Uh, so when I was fifteen, I got my ears pierced, and then I like 
once again, didn't tell my parents, just started, you know, swapping out bigger jewelry. And I'm sensing a theme here. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, just kind of sure. just yeah. impulsive and just yeah. doing whatever the fuck I wanted to do. Uh, and so just started stretching my ears until one day my mom's like, are, are, are those getting bigger? No, no, you know, no, 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 no. Until Get I had like an inch, and <laughs> an inch and a half hole in my ear. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, I, I looked up at, at my great grandma, my mom, when I was like 10 or 11 and I was like, Yo, I'm going to, I'm going to have like a ton of tattoos. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like I'm going to have like my whole body tattooed. Yeah. Like I want to have like, you know, my face, my neck, like, but like, and, and like my, I remember my great grandma like looked at me and started crying. Yeah. Ironically, she, she passed. Um, but Sorry, once, yeah. no, it's, it's okay. Uh, once I, I was all tattooed, she always loved, she always loved them. Uh, did she? Yeah. And she's, she's so cool. She, she died when she was 97. Nice. Um, I love that. Well, not nice. Sorry. Not nice. No, 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 no. Like, it's I fine. Love, uh, I love that number. But she was so, she was so supportive and she's from Argentina. So she had this, like, she was just so cute and like old and like little. She's Argentinian? Yeah. Yeah. We went to Argentina last year. I'd never been there before. Oh, really? I go, I try to go once a year. Oh, yeah, we loved it. We went for a couple of weeks. I had a break on the show for a few episodes. What Not part of Argentina did you go to? We did uh, Buenos Aires for a wedding, and then we went down to El Calafate, nice. and we did uh, the Perino Marino Glacier, and then we also went over- Damn, no, you're more seasoned than I am, dude. We did, the, we did the glacier. El Calafate, I think, is where we went, and no, we did the glacier from there, too, and then we also drove, maybe this is El Calafate, I can't remember, but we did a hike up to, like, Mount Fitzroy up in that area. I've been to Buenos Aires. That's it. Oh, it was fucking wild, man. Yeah. See, I like, I love, I struggle with travel because like, I like to travel, but I kind of don't. And the only way that I like to travel is if I feel like I'm kind of in an Indiana Jones movie. Okay. Or like, it's like an adventure to <laughs> yeah. me. Like something I want to do that we're going to start planning now is like Antarctica. Damn. Like I want to do that. It's going to take a couple of years to plan it. I like to go places where like, if I die there, I'm like, cool. So oh, shit. Great- See, I'm the exact opposite. I'm like, okay, I want to like go just in civilization. No, see, I'm not like, I'm not a city guy. Like I'm not, I grew up on a farm in New York and there are certain cities that I like, but what I've learned about myself as I've gotten a little older is I just, I love being in nature. I camp whenever I can. I've done a lot of backpacking and stuff like that. So being on that, we hiked on the glacier for like eight, nine, 10 hours. And you feel it moving, you know, and you and you hear these sounds. It sounds like thunder because it's breaking, right? Yeah, it's moving. And oh like, my god, no! And they show you. I'd the, have an anxiety attack. No, for me that was like I was in heaven. I, was in heaven. I have a really cool video from it, a bunch of great photos from it, and I love that stuff. And they also showed us because it, it, you know, it gives you a sense of the world too. And like I, one of the things I love about being out in nature, I mean, it doesn't get any more you know power of nature than like a glacier. Really, it makes me feel insignificant in a good way. Where yeah. I recognize that I'm part of this whole thing. And you know, dude, the first time I ever smoked weed, the first time I got high, yeah. tra- traumatizing too. I couldn't smoke weed for like six or seven months after that. First time I smoked weed, uh, I found, I had, I was like 15. Yeah. And my high school girlfriend, I caught her cheating on me. Oh no. We like went to the movies, right? And she was like, oh, I'm going to the what football game. What movie did game. you see? We didn't see the movie. Like that you was didn't the even thing. See the movie? No, no, that was the thing. When you were like, you know, fifteen, you'd go to the movie theaters, right? And you would just like kind of fucking hang out. Like this was before I drove, dude. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, my I parents, get it. Yeah. like literally, like my fucking well, my homie drove me there. Um, and I remember we, I, I got super stoned, and these kids were like, I was hanging out with like these kids that were way older than me, so they, would you know, been smoking weed and shit. Sure. Uh, and and so we're sitting in, uh, we're sitting in in a McDonald's and I'm eating and this kid comes up to me. I, I was going to a private school. My, that, my high school girlfriend was going to a public school mm-hmm. and she said she was going to a football game with her cousin. And this kid comes up to me in McDonald's. I don't know him. And he's like, yo, you're Travis. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And he's like, uh, you're dating, uh, you're dating so-and-so, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, she's at Taco Bell right there with uh, with this dude, Steve. I'll never forget his name. Steven. Steven. Okay. <laughs> it was Steve. fucking, fucking Steven. Fucking Steven. Fucking Steven. Oh, fucking Steven. And uh, and I'm like. Get him on the show. Get him yeah, on the right. show. <laughs> See what he's up to now. He was a water polo player and he was like two grades older than me. The and worst. He, he drove. The worst. He drove. All of that is water polo player, two years older, <laughs> drove a car. You're fucked. I'm like sorry. like varsity water polo, went to a public school. Yeah, you know, you're he's done. like 17. Um, and he's like, yeah, she's in his, he had a VW, uh, van, you yeah. know, like those old school VW a cool vans. One. Yeah. A cool, it was orange and white and it was all like nice and restored. And dude, 
uh, literally, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I was like, let's go. And I was with two of my homies. One of my homies, Big Kyle, because he was like, he was big, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we walk over and literally I see the van and I go up there and sure enough, she's sitting in the front seat, right? And like, no. dude- I'm like, I, I just like, I, I like, lo- like, I don't even know what started happening. So I try to like open up the door. Right. And he locks the door. And so I'm trying to like open up the door and I'm looking at her like, you know, what's up? And then something clicks in my head and I'm like, go to his side of the door. Yeah. So I walk around and I try to start pulling his door open. We got escalation there now. Oh, though, right? a lot of escalation. Yeah. And then, so I go from, and, and big Kyle standing behind the VW uh, hippie van yeah. so that he can't leave. Yeah. So then I start socking his window, right? Good, good old big <laughs> Kyle. I love big Kyle. So then I start socking his window and I'm trying to break his fucking window. And then this, the window won't fucking break. And so I start kicking the side of his door. Sure. And this dude loved his van, right? With good, I mean, with good reason. Yeah, like, but you're going to fuck nice it up. Yeah. But, so I start kicking the fucking side of his door. I'm just like, kicking the shit. This fool turns on his van, hits it in reverse, runs over Big Kyle's foot. No. Swear to God. Runs over Big Kyle's foot. Dude, I grew up in Riverside, which is like a very, let's call them bros. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. Motor, motorcycle, like motocross, like, you know, lifted trucks, fucking Dickies shorts with like black socks pulled up. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. The, the, the brim of your hat bent up, you know, like. Yeah. Really white, white trash. The whole right? thing. Yeah. yeah. So these dudes, they had a fucking lifted Bronco and um, no top on it, right? These two bros pull out of the fucking Taco Bell drive-thru. They see what happened and they're like, yo, bro, hop in. And so I fucking hop in these random fucking dudes' cars. They had like a bat or like a pipe or something. Bros like to it, the rescue. Bro, like literally like white trash bros to the rescue, like <sighs> seeing that they just ran over my homie's foot and I'm like punching this dude's fucking van. And they're like, bro, hop in. So me and Big Kyle hop in this Bronco and we start chasing the van. Right. And dude, they booked it. Like we, they fucking, they took off. Uh, so the bros drop us back off at McDonald's and I'm high for the first time ever. So yeah. my eyes are bloodshot sure, red. Right. Sure. So like I go to like the little, there's like a circle K right there and I get some Visine and shit, but I call my mom and I'm like, uh, and I just started like, I just like started crying. Right. Because one, if I'm crying, then my eyes are going to be red. Yeah. So yeah, she's yeah, not yeah, going to yeah, think yeah, I'm yeah. high. Yeah. Smart. So I call my mom and I'm like, you know, da, 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 oh my God, she, she was, you know, da, 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 cheating on me. So my mom comes and picks me up. I go home. I took all of like, you know, the notes that she wrote me, uh, like all like the fucking, you know, like the little Did you you know, gifts. It? No, I had my mom drive me to her house and I threw it on her fucking front porch and broke up with her. Good and for you. Didn't talk to her anymore. Get her on the show too. Let's no, just, yeah, you know what? I think we're better. We're okay, better okay, off. Yeah, uh, we've, Kyle, we've like we. I mean, dude, it was when I was fifteen, uh, and we ended up. I think we ended up going to like the same cosmetology school for a few months, and I mean, it was like we're we we're fine. Yeah, yeah, nobody gives a shit after you know no, like, that whole it, stuff is ancient history. But you I know. literally, I like die lap. But yeah, like so, literally, my first time smoking weed and my first time doing mushrooms was traumatic and I couldn't smoke for like six or seven months after that because I would just relate it to that feeling of like betrayal. Yeah. You know, I had this like weird kind of, yeah, this weird relationship in my head of, of, with like weed and, and, and feeling that, that like anger, you know? And you know, and I know some people that have had really bad experiences on stuff like that, that just can't ever touch it again. Cause mm. it was that bad. And it's like, if that's your thing, like if that's what happened, then just don't, you know? Italian like, with water polo. Like I, I, I'm not able to play or I, even enjoy, the, I couldn't enjoy even watch try. It was so, you know, <laughs> for me, it was just too much, you know, <laughs> Steven. Fuck water polo, man. Yeah. We need like a, a an Fuck anti- the summer Olympics. <laughs> Fuck them. Yeah, but water polo is only one event. Fuck them all. Fuck them all, man. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was funny that, yeah, I chased, I was like 15 and I chased away like a senior, you know? So that was cool. It was empowering, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now. And like that weird 15 year old way. You look back now, you'd be like, fucking stop. Yeah. Go home. <laughs> Learn how oh, to smoke weed. Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, you know, man. I smoked out of a can too. That was the worst part. We used to do like, an apple. In okay. College sometimes you smoke out of the old apple. Yeah, I smoked yeah. out of a Coke can. Yeah. That was rough times. Life has definitely gone uphill since since those days. Yeah, but it's all good stuff, right? It's all good stuff. <laughs> did you play sports in high school? I didn't. I, a lot of people think that I did. Well, you look um, like a yeah. You look like a very fit dude. Yeah. You know the funny the funny thing about that is that like. 
I had this reaction. I grew up, I grew up on a farm and I grew up working on farms. So like we did a lot of manual labor. Lifting hay and shit. Yeah. So I had a lot of that stuff, but <clears throat> excuse me, I wasn't an athletic guy and I'm still not like terribly coordinated or anything. And that actually makes me nervous is like doing athletic things. I've done. I'm so clumsy, dude. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. But when I was 17 and I started doing like the school plays and like theater and that, that kind of thing, I think as like a, a t- to kind of counter that, I started hitting the weight room. Mm. And so like when I started hitting the weight room, I fell in love with it. And that was one of the things that I've carried with me ever since then. 17, what is it now for? You know, uh, 17, 18 years later, I'm still in the gym at least three hours a week. And I trained in a powerlifting style for years, which was super, super fun. And in college, that's all I did was like bench, squat, deadlift, and like do movies at the college on the weekends. Like it was great. It was so great. It taught me so much about myself too. And it taught me some of that work ethic that we were talking about earlier, where if you just put it in, you'll get the return on your investment to yeah. a degree, you know? And that was also something that I control. Because the way that I grew up, I didn't have a lot that I control in my life. Everything felt out of control. So you can control everything for that hour when you go into the gym. But I was not athletic and I just started hitting the weight room, hitting the weight room. And like when I graduated high school, I saw people like three, four years later and they're like, what the fuck? What are you doing? Yeah, when I was in college, I was like almost 240 at one point and like still pretty lean. And I'm like 200, 205 now, but I was like 240 pounds, you know, deadlifting over 500 pounds, squatting over 400, benching over 300, like all that stuff. It was fucking great. It was great. And it taught me a lot. And I still, like, I went to the gym today and I love doing that stuff. But no, not athletic at all. Do you have to get shirtless a lot on your show? Not on my show. I've had to do that in the past. Yeah. Have you ever had to do, like, have you ever had to be naked on camera? No, I or, never like, have. Like, do any, like, new, like, weird, implied, like, nudity? I've never, I, I had to do, like, a lot of shirtless stuff in the past. But on this show, I think because we air at 8 o'clock, we don't do a lot of it. Can't be as risque. Yeah, they're like, no nipples, you know, yeah. or whatever. But <laughs> My girlfriend's in a bra. You know, in panties all the time. Do they air at nine o'clock though? I, yeah, I think they I do. Think there's like this weird <laughs> yeah. thing where like eight, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock now. Nine o'clock. Oh yeah. Eight o'clock. Everybody's got to pray at least one yeah, point yeah. in the episode. Yeah. Sometimes nine o'clock. Like soft dicks, core, buttholes, dude. It's everything. It's like soft core, man. Yeah. 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 It's like yeah, am I it watching there. Showtime? Skinamax? Or? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the scrambled porn from when you were like twelve. Yes, yes. Riverdale. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But, <laughs> but uh, no, I never, I never do that on my show. I never like take take the shirt off or anything. I haven't had to do that. I, I feel like I'd just be so vulnerable. I just feel like so vulnerable. It's weird, right? It's like a, it, it, what it was for me. It's a it, control thing though, too, because like, you don't like, you know, I mean, especially like with a show, like you don't know what shots they're going to use. You don't no. know like how, yeah. So I don't know, man. It also like looking back on it, the times that I did it and I've done it for a few shows and we get like in really good shape for it. But the mindset that it put me in is something that it's such a, you know, I know we're all creating a product when we do the acting stuff. And, and that became kind of tricky for me where it was like, I'm getting like a six pack or whatever. I'm doing all this stuff. But it was such a, uh, I thought about that so much in like the week leading up or the two weeks leading up. It was like, can't eat this, well, can't eat that. Well, can't be shirtless and so, okay. Yeah, got to go to the gym all the time, got to do this. It was really unhealthy, you know, it compromised my identity in some ways. And now it's like, if they call me tomorrow and they're like, be shirtless tomorrow, I'd be like, oh, fuck, you better airbrush the fuck out of me. But like, <laughs> you know, like I started, I started to relax on that more. I was like, you don't have to look fucking perfect, you know, nobody cares. I, I'm trying to do more of like, I go to the gym it's therapeutic for me. It's cathartic for how for you me. feel. Yeah, mentally, yeah. Yeah. But also, I understand that I like the product. I am the product, and I need to like keep that in a certain degree of 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 shape. But I try to balance that with like this. Also, makes me happy. You yeah. know, rather than this is something that I would do even if I wasn't doing this line of work, I'd still be hitting the gym as much as I could, three four hours a week, whatever. You know, you're a good looking dude. Do you have uh, Do you have a lot of girls like hopping in your DMs, like just saying random, like weird, crazy shit? I ignore it. I ignore it. I am. I am. I'm spoken for. I'm super super happy. I ignore it as much as I possibly can. I don't even look in there because for a couple of reasons. One of which is like obviously I'm with somebody and she's amazing. She's the greatest person I know. But don't you feel like it's almost like ro- like it's roles are reversed, right? Where like girls are like. I don't know. It's, it's so, it's, it's kind of creepy. Like the, the shit, expectation there, the though, shit that like, people will say though. Yeah. yeah. And that was something I was thinking about too, is like the first, like that pilot that I told you about that I did was 2010. And even going back eight, nine years, how much have things changed with Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. I know people talk about this all the time, but even 10 years ago, this stuff wasn't really a thing where people had this much access to a personality, this much access to an artist could DM them. Like that's only last like five years, I guess. Yeah. Five, six years that's become a thing. And that, I think about kids that are 15 now 
14 now, 12 now, 17 now. What the fuck is that like? I'm so happy I didn't go to high school with Snapchat and fucking Twitter and- It was bad know, enough, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah. Well, I just couldn't imagine like just showing up or like, I don't know, man. Like you do something fucking stupid in class and everybody in class Snapchats it, you know? And then like, you're that dude that, you know- it went viral. Exactly, exactly. And I guess it could be a blessing and a curse, right? Because there's kids who, you know, have an incredible voice and they're singing, you know, at the lunch table and then that shit, yeah. next week they're on Ellen. Yeah, yeah, You know, and their life changes. The kid that yodeled or whatever. Or like, like Justin Bieber, you know, like doing the that YouTube was, that video. That was that whole thing, right? 13 years old and getting, you know, so for that, it can be really good. But at the same time, I mean, you know, you can make one mistake and, you know, you're infamous, you know, forever at it's 14. Weird. It's super, super weird. It's- the shit I was doing, yeah, dude, yeah. What if people were Snapchatting me on mushrooms, getting slapped and spit on, you know, at sixteen? How the fuck would that turn out? You, oh, I don't, I don't want to know. No, good man. hashtag, good content. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hashtag exactly. Great hashtag content. Great content. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe you, you know, I don't know. Maybe that would be. Maybe I'd be for you. selling mushrooms or <laughs> yeah, in Riverside with a gun in your waist and you know, in a van, one of those cool Volkswagen vans. Right? I had, you know, uh, when I was in that shitty, when I was like in a shitty like band, uh, I bought a 1992 Ford Family Wagon, and it was like this this like awful van, and that's what we toured in. Yeah, um, yeah, and it was like the ground, it was like carpet uh, floors, but it was like squishy carpet, so yeah. like we would like take the seats out and just all sleep in there yeah um but we probably looked really sketchy like rolling around in like a white <laughs> you know with the windows like i have 92 out. tattooed on my thighs and that's that's for that's for that that's man. cool i love that yeah yeah it's, it was the 92 that's what we called her as long as you didn't like spray paint free candy on the side no toys yeah no. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey <laughs> Yeah, it's 2.30. We better get over there. Oh, man. I shouldn't say that. No, uh, I've done, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I've done a lot of stupid shit in my life that I'm glad wasn't documented. Um, Me too. And now I'm glad that I'm able to document, you know, this part of my life because I have a little bit more more brain. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if I had been documenting all this stuff 10 years ago, 15 years ago, fucking hell, man. Like, I just didn't, there's so many more things that I know now in a great way. Like, it's that growth that, I, you're talking about turning 30 soon. It's like- April that, 12th, dude. April 12th, man, coming up. <sighs> it's that growth that comes just with time if you allow it to, you know? Um, I think some people don't allow it to as much, but, you know, I think it's good to to let that happen because it just 29 was my best birthday ever. Um, That's and, good. Yeah, Madeline and I, we went to, we went to Cancun. Nice. Um, and she surprised me. And yeah, we went to Cancun and it was like, it was, I felt like, uh, I felt like a, like a, like a basketball player's wife. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like we get in there and there was like flowers on the bed that said like, happy birthday. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn, you love me. Uh, but it was That's really great. cool. One, I've never really taken a vacation. Yeah. Like ever. I just kind of always had this like mentality of like, you know, I, I got to work and I got to work, work, yeah, work, work, that. work. Um, and so that was kind of the first time that I was able to, you know, for like four days, uh, just enjoy some time off. And, How was that? It was good. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. We like literally, I, <laughs> I actually threw, I got super sick the last night. I threw up like, I, I spent like all night throwing up because I ate so much food. Just that much food. Just, just like had to- literally that much food because like, you know, it was like literally anything we wanted and I was eating like, you know, shrimp tacos and then I had like lobster and then I had like, you know, I, I just ever and then they like the chef there was like, she's vegan. Um, so yeah. they were making like all this incredible vegan food. So yeah. I was having that. I was drinking beer. It was like, I just like overindulged. You uh, needed like the, the Roman or Greek like vomitorium where you could go like <laughs> let a little bit of it out and then go back for more. That was like both of the bathrooms in our hotel room. I like utilized both. I went from you like two, one. Two yeah, bathrooms. Two like, bathrooms. This was, this was a good birthday. It was great. Yeah, we had a we had like a, a, a hot tub like outside of our, like we had like a God big, damn. Ba- it was it was dope. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I blew up, you know, both bathrooms with uh with throw up and, and definitely, the flight home was awful. Yeah. Because it was just like, I was so depleted and I was like, nothing is. Didn't want to eat any food. Like I was, I was done eating for like two days. Have you ever done the like? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then just pure, just projectile vomit everywhere. Dude, that happens to me. Like when I lay down. Like anytime I like lay down and like I'm spinning. I'm like, no, I'll be fine. I'm just gonna go to sleep. And then I'm like, I'm, I'm in my own head. Here's my thing though. I would rather make myself throw up if I feel sick mm-hmm. than kind of like thug it out and like maybe not. Mm-hmm. I, I'm the kind of guy where like if something bad is gonna happen, I just want to get it over with. Yeah, I get that. You I know? get that. So I'll just. Ugh. 
um, and then just put myself uh, out of out of my misery. As I get like a little bit older, I I don't have that problem anymore. And I was never like a big like, oh, I drank so much I barfed or whatever. I mean, obviously it happens. It happens to everybody. I'm not a big drinker. That yeah, happens I, to me like uh, if if I drink before, like if I drink without smoking weed and then I smoke, that's when I'll get the spins. If I okay. smoke and then drink, I'm fine. You're fine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like as I get older, like I like I didn't know what a hangover was till I was like 30, 31. And I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. Okay, great. Oh, really? But, I got my yeah. first hangover with my uncle when I was like, I was probably like, I don't know. 14, 15. Really? Yeah. And, and we, he was house sitting my grandparents' house and I went over there to spend the night. I was like, uh, and he had like a 30 pack of like Budweiser. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Like, you know, the real deal, yeah. red and white American, you know. Drink just fucking and, beer. Uh, I just, I drank a shit ton of beer. I smoked a shit ton of cigarettes and projectile vomited everywhere. Woke up the <clears> next morning because my grandparents were coming home. We had to go to breakfast with them. Mm. And I'm like, I didn't know what a hangover was. And so I'm sitting down at this breakfast, my fucking head's pounding. And uh, I ordered like three things of orange juice. And my, I'll never forget, my grandpa made a joke. He's like, oh, what are you hung over? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. I didn't drink for a while after that. Yeah. That was awful. Do you remember your, your, you were, th- how old are you? Your first hangover? I mean, like youngest of three boys, I have two older brothers, so. That was a different experience with like learning how Did to Did you drink. live like vicariously through them? Like you kind of like learned from all their mis- mistakes? It's almost like a trial by fire too though. Mm. It's like, you know, you sort of get a sense of, and they're compassionate guys. They're great guys. They would never be like, hey, let's get them fucked up and make them barf. But like you try to keep up with the older brothers and like stuff happens, you know? Like Definitely. 22 doing like Irish car bombs, you know, like Guinness with a thing like, oh, what's <laughs> this? Oh, it tastes like chocolate milk. Okay, great. Drink that. Two of those. And you're like, okay, oh God. But uh, my first drink, I don't remember how old I was, but my first drink was, uh, we were cleaning out my grandmother's house and it was this bottle of Old Crow whiskey that was so old, the alcohol had started crystallizing in it again. And we showed it to my mom. We're like, where did, and she's like, that's got to be your uncle's. That's got to be at least 40 years old, 40, 50 years old. That's that good shit. Yeah, man. It's like, well, that's good. A, yeah, good old girl, man. <laughs> yeah. And uh, took it home and I, I don't remember how old I was, but my brother was like, I'd never done anything like that. And he was like, you should try some. I was like, yeah, but you know, it's probably not going to taste it. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, it's really sweet. It's really good. He's like, it's going to taste like, you know, like ice cream. It's going to taste like ice cream. So I like, he's like, you got to drink it quick. Otherwise it doesn't taste good. You got to drink the shot quick. Otherwise it doesn't taste good. So I shot this old crow and was like, oh my God. And that was my first drink ever. Mm. It's a great way to like break it. It's better than, I feel like it's better than Budweiser. It is totally yeah, better than yeah, Budweiser. I feel like you had a better one than me. It is totally better than it. It was probably the cigarettes that did it more than anything. For oh, you, I though. bet. I bet. Yeah, I quit smoking three years ago. And it was good the best thing, best thing I ever did. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. That's good. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the mics cut on, and uh, you were talking about the crossover episodes yeah. that you guys are about to do. Uh, we did them. We, oh, we you filmed, already did? Yeah, we filmed them a couple weeks ago. They aired uh, in December. They do those every year. This one was super, super cool. But as I was telling you, they're like, there's they're this huge production where they bring the three, four shows together. I think it was three shows this year. Yeah, Supergirl, Flash, and Arrow. Um, and it's super cool for me to see that because I grew up with a trunk full of comic books and like, that's what we did. We read those comic books. So seeing these, you know, oh, it's Green Arrow and the Flash and the same thing. And then Supergirl comes in there, Superman. I thought it was a really cool idea before I started this show, before I worked on it. And now I think it is great. And I thought the one they did this past year was super cool. It was like this body swap thing where, where like, you know, the Flash wakes up and he's Green Arrow and Green Arrow wakes up and he's like the Flash. And I was like, this is cool. Like, this is super fun and like accessible and like what a great thing to do for a couple of hours of TV. Yeah. But it's a huge undertaking to bring all these people together. I bet. I mean, when I started last year, they were doing last year's and I wasn't in them. I went away for a couple of weeks and came back and I was like, hey guys. And they were all like thousand yard stairs, like super tired because they've been doing 16, 17 hours a day. And one of the 80s was like, we're shooting four episodes of TV at the same time right now. Super, super hard to do, but everybody comes together and works their asses off and makes it work, which wow. is a, like an incredible thing to see happen. The actors, the crew, the crew bust their asses. The writers bust their asses. So many different things you have to satisfy. So many things you have to do weaving all these shows together. It's super cool to see that happen. Definitely. It's great. 
Dude, thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah it's been great. I appreciate it. Uh, what nights? Is, you want to tell everyone where to check all, all your shit out? Uh, yeah, we're back. We started this past Tuesday. We're 8 p.m. on the CW. We started this past Tuesday, and now we're going to run through the end of the season. Nice. Uh, you want to hit everyone with your sh- social media? Yeah, Instagram is at Hartley Sawyer. Twitter is at Hartley Sawyer. Awesome. Dude, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Yeah, Are you going to go to Comic-Con? Uh, this summer? Yeah, I'll yep, be there. I'll yeah. be there, too. Yeah, Let's yeah. hang out. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah, I'll see you there. Yeah, you just watched The Friendship you know, happen. It live. just blossomed yeah, in front of just, your eyes. Just, re- just, you know, we, we got it. We yeah. got it. We're going to go take mushrooms now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we already did. Yeah. <laughs>